Welcome back, Breakaway Wealth. I'm your host, Jim Oliver, and with me today is Brian Flaherty. Brian, welcome, buddy. Jim, good afternoon. How are you today? I'm doing great. It's a sunny day here in Southwest Florida, and I understand the weather's getting better up there in Louisville. We're, we're making the turn to spring, so we're headed in the right direction, my friend. You know, uh, Kentucky is such a beautiful state. Um, I was at a barbecue last night. I was talking about Kentucky and guy the guy was from indianapolis and he was trying to convince me how much better uh indianapolis was as a town than louisville and i because it had more industry and everything else and i thought you know i've been to both towns and i would have to say that i'm a fan of louisville more than indianapolis but for anybody that's from indianapolis i hope that i didn't offend you but it's just louisville has that small town feel but it's a big town that's right. That's right. Biggest small town is what we kind of all joke around yeah. here. And I, I'm looking at my phone now. It looks like we're about 10 degrees warmer than Indy. Uh, so there we got go. that on it as well. You, th there you go. That In my book, you win. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Brian. So the audience kind of gets an idea of what you are doing and what you've done. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, absolutely, Jim. Well, appreciate you having me on and thanks to everybody tuning absolutely. in today. Uh, my name is Brian Flaherty. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of CF Capital. Like Jim mentioned, we are headquartered in beautiful Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, we are a private equity investment firm that acquires and develops multifamily properties in and around the Southeast. So I always say when you're driving down the road and you look over out the side of your window and you see a 200 unit apartment complex, most people probably don't stop and think, I wonder, gee, I wonder who owns that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's groups like myself. Uh, that's what we do. But before the apartment world, um, I have a background that spans to Wall Street. So I spent a number of years on a firm um, working on Wall Street, which is a fun and fast life. Uh, I was able to reach a certain amount of success in my late 20s, but I also realized it wasn't it wasn't quite for me, Jim. And I, I, you know, one thing I love about apartments is, you know, the financials are the financials and that's the way you run things and you can drive price value. But one thing that that always got me hung up in the Wall Street world is, hey, I can underwrite these fundamentals and this business is doing well. And lo and behold, the CEO comes out and says something crazy on TV and, you know, stock plummets. And you're like, man, this is, this is tough. Or, or nowadays, uh, you know, somebody sends out a tweet um, and the stock's either going up or going down or we're to the moon or, you know, we're down 30%. So Wall Street is a, it's a fun, flashy, Las Vegas type of world. Um, a lot of, a lot of fun. I learned and, you know, I, I learned a tremendous amount. Don't regret it for a bit. But again, I kind of knew it wasn't for me in the long term. I knew I wanted to get to a place where I had more control, um, where I could work towards developing streams of passive income. Um, and, and we'll probably get to it in the talk today. But I kind of woke up one day and realized and said, hey, this, this whole retirement thing's probably not for me. You know, I'm a guy in my late 20s. I'm up early, I'm to bed late, I'm now married, I got multiple kids, like the idea of, you know, sailing off to desert island and having my ties starting at noon every day, sound, sounds fun for about a week and, and I'm gonna get an itch uh, and I'm gonna have to find something else to do. So the thought of ultimate retirement um, wasn't really for me. And then I also realized, hey, if I do retire, you know, whatever day that is, 65, 70, one of two things has to happen. Either that big bag of cash that I've been working towards is going to run out or I'm going to find myself six feet underground um, and it's going to be a race to what happens first. So I said, you know, hey, I need to I need to figure out another way. There's got to be better ways out there, you know, to, to kind of define my lifestyle and live my primary aim. So after spending, again, a significant amount of time kind of exploring what that meant to me. Uh, ultimately, I arrived at the decision, hey, I've got this background of institutional equity market on Wall Street. I want to marry that up with commercial real estate, which I've found is the best vehicle for me personally to kind of live my lifestyle and also give the 
give off the returns that I'm looking for and provide inter returns to the investors that we partner with. So I took a step away from Wall Street. I, I realized, you know, to get to that area of being a general partner on some of these commercial real estate deals, I need to go and apprentice somewhere. I need to, while well, I've got the financial background and the MBA and things like that, I really need to roll up my sleeves and, you know, get dirty in some deals. And the best way I found to do that was to go be a broker and to say, hey, let's see, you know, how these deals are really done. Let's learn from the best of the best. Let's see who's doing deals the right way, who's doing deals the wrong way, who we should be partnering with, who we shouldn't be partnering with, and really have my crash course um, in commercial real estate. I, I was lucky enough to spend time at CBRE leading their institutional disposition team here in Louisville for a number of years before spinning out and starting my own private equity firm, CF Capital, like I mentioned, uh, we launched in 2020. But I'll pause there and yeah. let you ask questions that we can clarify things for the audience here today. Yeah, so you know you, what, what I was thinking about when you were talking about Wall Street there in the beginning, the word that came to my mind, and you and you brought it up as control, is you know we like to say whoever controls the money makes the money, right? And you know, also being in control of your life versus somebody else being in control of your life. I mean, it's really the things nightmares are made of for me, and. Um, you know, Nick Costco and I joke because I do have this reoccurring nightmare every so often that I'm working for somebody else. And I, I wake up and I'm sweating and I'm and I'm thinking to myself, oh, thank goodness that was just a dream. Right. And um, so it's been a, I've really never worked for somebody else, but I've kind of always been in business for myself. So it's 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 uh it is an, it would be a nightmare to me to have to answer to somebody and somebody else telling me what to do on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you go from Wall Street and you shift that mindset, was there was there a moment in time or did there was there something that happened that you just said, because this is what I find is when people decide, that's the hardest part, is once you decide you're going to do something, the rest is easy. But it's that you have to make that decision of I'm going to do this. Was there some thing that happened or just a moment that you can remember that 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 happened where you just made that decision? You know, Jim, I wish I could say point to one one you know moment in time, but really it was an evolution for me, and it was over over kind of an elongated period of time. But to, to kind of rewind to what you were saying, you know, having ultimate control and being in business for yourself and working for yourself. Well, I found myself, I guess, coming up through the ranks of go to school, get good grades, get a job. You know, that's, that's just the next progression in life. And then you go and you, you punch that time clock for 30, 35 years. And one of these days, you know, you, you're done. Um, and it's interesting after a couple of years out of college, I realized I knew enough to know, you know, there had to be something else for me. And I, I was kind of spinning my wheels and said, man, this is, this is tough. I'm only a couple of years into this. There's no way I could make this, you know, another 35, 40 years. And I said, okay, well, maybe it's time for me to get educated on something. And I, I simply Googled, I was, I was like, what are the, what are the number one business books out there right now? Like, that sounds good. I should go into business for myself. And there's a book out there, a little purple book that probably a lot of your risk listeners have read uh, by Robert Kiyosaki and Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I picked it up and Jim, no, no kidding. I got about two thirds through that book and said, this is kooky. Like this, I, I don't have a clue what this means. What is this guy talking about? I couldn't even finish the book. I was so ingrained in another way. And it was the <laughs> absolute inverse from what Kiyosaki talks about. It, it couldn't even get through to me. And maybe it was because it wasn't the right time to be speaking to me. Fast forward a couple of years later, that book sat on a shelf, collected a lot of dust and I picked it back up again and I read it and I said, aha, okay, there it is. Like now it's speaking to me, now it clicks. And anyone that has read those books knows about the four quadrants, the E and the S, the B and the I. 
you know, I found myself in the employee quadrant where I'm highly taxed and I'm, I'm doing pretty well for myself, but man, if I'm not making the people that run the business a heck of a lot more money than I'm making every year. And I said, okay, I got to get myself out of this E quadrant, this employee quadrant where I have basically no control. And I said, how can I navigate my way through it? Um, and, and it began with educating myself and gobbling up as many podcasts and reading books. And I'm a pretty fervent learner. And it was just, give me all the information that I can. Let me digest all of this. But then at some point it becomes analysis paralysis and you got to move. And you say, you know, let's, it's great that I know all this, but unless I act on it, you know, so what? No big deal. And we were actually awaiting our, our firstborn uh, to arrive. And I'll never forget, we, we were taking uh, one last kind of trip before the kiddos were there. And I looked at my wife and I said, hey, when we get back from this trip, I'm going to leave my job and I'm going to go into commercial real estate. And she, <laughs> she kind of giggled and said, uh, do what? And I said, yeah, you know, you, I've been doing this, uh, all this learning and kind of networking. And when I go back, now's the time because there's never going to be a better time. There's no, I'll say this, Jim, there's no right time. There's never going to be a time where the sea parts and all the lights are green and, you know, you say, oh, now's, now's the best time. So I said, hey, we're about ready to have one big life changing event uh, of our firstborn child. Let's make it two. Why don't I go ahead and pivot out uh, right now? And really, to me, I kind of took the burn the boats mentality of if I don't, if I just kind of dip a toe into it and kind of leave myself an out, I'm probably never going to go all in on it. Mm -hmm. So it's let's leave, let's get out of Wall Street and let's dive head first into this. So that's a long winded answer to say, you know, it, it took me a while to realize that I needed that control, that there was something else out there other than grinding it out in my nine to five for 40, 45 years. Um, and then ultimately it was, you know, you got to make that leap of faith. So you, you said a couple of really uh, cool things in there. One, I would tell you that that moment that I was looking for was that conversation with your wife, right? When you could verbalize it to your wife, honey, I'm quitting my job. And she thinks, oh my gosh, my husband's lost his mind for a moment. <laughs> and that, and you, and you, like you said, you burn the ships, you know, and, and there's no going back. That's that moment. And that moment is the moment you decided because you might have decided in your heart and your mind, but the moment you tell your spouse, hey, this is what I'm doing. There's no going, you know, like, because you would look crazy if the next day you woke up and said, hey, you remember that conversation we had last night? Just forget all about it. I came to my senses, <laughs> right? Like, like that, then you, you know, your, your spouse would question, but, you know, you, you said that and then the, that commitment. So, you know, there are a lot of people in the audience, Brian, and maybe they're working a job or, you know, maybe they're on their own business and, you know, they're in the, for the, if you haven't seen the cash flow quadrant, we'll include that in the uh, show notes because um, what Brian's talking about is how we get away from the high tax left side of the quadrant to the right side of the quadrant, either as a business owner, a true business owner, and not, a, not a slave to a business and, and, or an investor. And um, Kiyosaki does such a great job in, in, in several of his books explaining this. I, I, I think that this is just the way my brain works. The book Second Chance talks all you need to know about it without going through a whole book like the, the, uh, the tax flow quadrant, right? Or the cash, cash flow quadrant. Cash That's flow right. quadrant. I knew I didn't say right. that right. So I love that book, by the way. I just think that Second Chance takes one chapter and gives you all the information that you need in that book. And even if you're a young guy like Brian, don't be scared away from Kiyosaki's book, Second Chance. It's a horrible title because it, it doesn't, I mean, it, it, it's not just about a second chance. It's, I, I think young people don't read it because they go, well, I don't need a second chance. I'm still on my first chance. So, um, but that and, you know, it's hard when we, you said something about shifting your paradigm. And um, I've, uh, as uh, the audience I've shared before, I spent 15 years doing full service, fee-based financial planning. So for me, when I read those 
I read two books, Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash and um, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Rich Dad, Poor Dad, I read way before, right when it came out. I did the same thing, Brian. I'm like, oh, this is, no, no, no. What I'm doing is right. I'm helping people do, you know, in Wall Street, putting my money in Wall Street. Oh, this is great, right? And, and so the book didn't resonate with me either. And I always say I'm a slow learner because I'm a slow I'm slow to change my paradigm. And um, Nelson's book didn't just hit me like a bolt of lightning either. So, um, but once I kind of got them down and I said, wait a minute, okay. And I validated them. So I validated becoming your own banker with math and, you know, like in, in, in talking to Nelson over and over and over and over again until he was probably sick of me. And then I, and I validated the, uh, rich dad, poor dad by analyzing all my clients. And I figured out my clients that had the most money, it came down to two categories, real estate and businesses, mm -hmm. you know, in some form of that, right? That's wide, but it wasn't, hey, that person started working for, you know, a, a startup company and it blew up. I mean, those people I just considered lucky. I threw them out of the, out of the equation. Those were the two, but not one. Hey, I started investing in Wall Street when I was 20. I kept on increasing the amount that I put in there. And the market just did so well for me, I became wealthy. Not one really wealthy, right? So when I look at that, Brian, I, I thought the same thing. So changing our paradigm, especially when we've been trained. So the, the longer that you've been trained in something, the harder it is to change. Right. That's why I love when young people come to infinite banking because they get it faster and they go, Hey, this makes sense. Why wouldn't I do that? That, you know, I get it. Sometimes people my age, they're like, Nope, I don't get it. Nope. That doesn't make any sense. Well, I can still take that money and I can do this, this, this. No, you can't. Let me go back and explain why that doesn't work. And uh, so I, I love, I love that. Uh, and now that uh, I love that you brought up those points. So let's talk about maybe some specifics um, of what you're doing now and advice that you would have or guidance. So are, are, do people, can come, people come to you and invest in your fund, your, your project? How, how does that work? Like, is it? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'll fill everybody in uh, kind of what we're doing, but I do want to take one quick step back and say, I had a similar experience when I read Nelson's book and I kind of, read it and tried to decipher it and said, well, there's three or four things that I don't really know about here. And, you know, let me reread this again. And, ah, oh, that makes a little bit more sense. And watch one or two of your and Nick's videos and say, well, that, that filled in that blank. Then I think one of the first conversations I had with you and Nick, when I reached out, I was, I said, guys, this seems too black and white. This is too simple. What am I missing? Like, I, I consider myself somewhat of an educated guy. Like, what, what am I not asking you? What am I missing here? And it was almost like the simplicity made me think that I was overlooking something. Um, yeah. And you guys did a beautiful job of saying, no, it's, it's right there. You, you are looking at this the right way. And, and that is the right way to look at this. So it, it was interesting to have that um, similar kind of mindset shift uh, when going through Nelson's book. Yeah. You know, so something, um, that's always the challenge. And I always say that Einstein said this, but you know, I don't know if he said it. That's what somebody told me. And so I believed it, but I can't find it, him, this quote attributed to him, but it, simplicity is elusive, you know? And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, it's kind of like, if you want to lose weight, you know, you eat less, you eat less and you lose weight, exercise more, it's, it's calories in calories out. We can complicate it and it, yeah, carbs treated the same as protein. I get all that, but the simplicity of it is move more, eat less, and your weight will go down, right? If that's what you need. So it's, it's Nelson would say, this is such a simple way of life. Don't complicate it. But the noise out there, Brian, in Wall Street says this, this is too complicated for you to understand. You need me to help you and you're going to pay me a fee to invest your money because you're not capable of doing that on your own. 
And you, you know, we really need these large financial institutions and these large funds to do all this because they have all the expertise and these people have education that you're never gonna have, right? And then there's the right. Kiyosaki camp and people that think like Kiyosaki saying, oh, you don't need any of that, right? In fact, that's, that's just a way for them to make a bunch of money. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he says, taking control of your life is the way that we make money. And then you look at Aust Austrian economics, you look at Nelson, what Nelson taught, you look at Bob Murphy and, you know, and again, Bob Murphy's got a PhD in economics. I don't need to try to, and this is my point to all of this, Brian, is I don't need to go learn what Bob Murphy learns. I just need Bob Murphy to explain things to me. So I don't need to go become a, you did come become an expert in commercial real estate, but I don't need to do that because I got you. I can just, it's, it's who, not how. Who can I associate with? Who can I, um, uh, you know, that's, that's the difference, right? And the, 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 the Wall Street cookie cutter, and again, by the way, there's some good Wall Street people out there that are actively managing, actively going, you know, the right side, I mean, not poo-pooing that. For that 1% or less, can you make money in Wall Street? Sure. But for the 99% where it's, mm -hmm. hey, you got the Edward Jones cookie cutter American funds portfolio. Oh, you have number one or number two? Oh, you got number one? Okay, good. And, and now you're gonna pay me a fee for that, right? And it's something you could get by calling a 1-800 number. That's the part of Wall Street that I don't like. But talk about, Talk about if I want to learn more about commercial real estate and what you found and kind of take me over that epiphany bridge of, you know, how do I learn more? How do I get on the bridge to, so, so I can educate myself to, to, is it something that I should be doing some of my money to, to, to invest in these commercial projects? Sure. And I think you bring up a good point there, Jim. We're, we're not poo-pooing or looking down on everyone in Wall Street. But at the same time, you mentioned it a little while ago, no one's ever diversified their way to wealth. You know, I had that moment too, where I realized, gosh, you know, the people you can do very well, you can do fine just investing in your 401k and living a diversified lifestyle. Um, and, and, and you can, you can do well, but I wanted more. And it was what's beyond that. What can I do to increase my means even more. And it was either running deep uh, on a business or I realized, gosh, there's a lot of people out there that do, that do pretty darn well in this commercial real estate uh, field. And that kind of led me that direction. But then also it really kind of spoke to me in reading some of Kiyosaki's books and the kind of philosophical uh, you know, background of, hey, if I, if I go into commercial real estate, there's a sector within it my sector, multifamily apartments, where actually I get to provide housing. So not only do I get to make solid financial decisions, I get to provide housing to folks that need it too. And at the end of the day, we all need food, water, and shelter. And so I'm providing one of the three things that we all need. And you mentioned one of my absolute favorite books, Who Not How, uh, by Dan Sullivan. And, you know, everyone, first off, if your li listeners haven't read that, stop, stop me. Don't stop Jim. But after this one, maybe go pick up a copy of that book and devour it immediately. Take notes, highlight all the above, and then reread it again, because it is another kind of mind altering book. Um, and it really just kind of teaches and implores folks to surround themselves with a team of what Dan calls who's and who's help us understand the hows. We don't have to go out there and understand, to your point, Jim, how everything works. We can align ourselves and build ourselves a team of who's that are specialists in that how vertical. So personally, I am a who for all of our investors because I know how to make smart investment decisions based on multifamily investing. And what we do at CF Capital, I always kind of say, we, you know, 
we're, we're offering bond-like returns during our hold period with the upside of an equity investment when we sell our assets. So what we do is we go out, we have a team, we have a team of who's ourselves. We have a team of who's our analysts, our debt professionals, our attorneys, our insurance team. We have a whole team of who's that know how to perform their house. So what we've done is we've built a best in class team and we go out, we identify uh, properties throughout the Kentucky, Tennessee, kind of Southeast region that are in some form of disrepair, whether that be operationally, um, whether that be it need, it's outdated, we need to go in and make interior and exterior upgrades. Essentially, every, every apartment building is its own business. And we go out there and we find undervalued uh, apartment buildings and businesses, and we revamp them to make a pretty nice return for our investors. That's cool. So, um, you know, I, again, I like some of the things that you said there is, um, you know, the more focused you are, just like if you're a doctor and you're a family doc and there's nothing wrong with that, <clears throat> but if you're a neurosurgeon or you're an orthopedic surgeon, you're focused on one thing, you know, typically you're going to get a higher compensation than, than the family doc. And I'm sure there's some family docs out there that, you know, have a concierge practice that is at a certain level that they're, they're making uh, as much as the specialist, but in, in general, a specialist makes more than a general practitioner. Right. right. And um, it's the same way when you really get these things down. Now, what, the thing that I've done in my life is I found people that were experts in things that I wasn't in, I wasn't an expert in. And that, you, know, you can go back and read books from a hundred and some years ago that say that's one of the secrets of success, right? And, um, you know, they US, they use US Steel and, and different examples. But I, I remember in late 2017, um, my one of my business partners, Bob Burnett, who was also a, a partner at Create Tailwind, is he said, Jim, what do you know about cryptocurrency? And I said, Bitcoin? He goes, no, there's a bunch of different cryptocurrencies. And I said, well, I just told you what I know. I know Bitcoin. I know that word. That's all I know about it. I don't know how it works. I don't know anything about it. I don't know where it's going, anything. And Bob became and is one of the top 10%, and that's probably in the top 2% of people that understand Bitcoin in the United States. So we have now five companies in the cryptocurrency space. Now, that's the cool thing is I'm still not the expert. Do I know a lot more than most people about it? Yeah, but I, I still have the expert and I can go out and I can become more and more involved and still not be the expert because all I got to do is find the experts, right? So if somebody wanted to reach out to you, Brian, and find out more about what you do and how they could be involved, uh, what, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, Jim, and it's it's neat because you're a who for me. I know enough about infinite banking, but I I don't know it, you know, a tenth of as much as you do. I I, I know what I'm doing uh, and to have my control, but I don't know how to set up, you know, my policies and to engineer them on which chassis. So you're a who for me uh, what, as it relates to IBC. That. And I'm a who for individuals that are looking to invest in commercial real estate, specifically in multifamily real estate. And they can learn a lot more about us. Like I mentioned, we're, we're a firm that focuses on acquiring and operating multifamily assets. And I say we provide stable cash flow, capital appreciation, and a pretty nice margin of safety. Um, I would love to have any listeners reach out, happy to have conversations, uh, set up times to, to jump on a phone together. Our website is CF cap llc.com that's cf cap llc.com and from there you can learn all about us myself my business partner tyler chesser our strategy our leadership core values um download company overviews all that kind of thing uh but again i would i would really encourage listeners to reach out because 
well, you can devour all the information on our on our website. It's always better to, to find some time to get on our calendar and for us to better understand what, what potential investors goals really are, because at the end of the day, we want we want to serve the right clients and we want to be the right who for your listeners, Jim. You know, I love, uh, by the way, the, the who, not how, you know, Dan's been saying that for years and I kick myself. I was telling Costco, uh, Nick Costco this the other day and our, this has been a few weeks, right when the book came out, I said, you know, I've been saying this for years. And of course I didn't even think this is what happens when you don't take action. Never occurred to me to go to Dan and say, I want to write this book about the concept that you have been talk talking about. And I want to write this book and I want you to come on and comment on it and, and do part of the book with me, which is honestly, in my opinion, part, probably the best part of the book is the little outtakes after the chapter with Absolutely. Dan. They're, yeah. they're, they're gold, man. They're worth 10 times whatever the book costs. And, um, and, you know, I never thought to do that. I kicked myself because we've been talking about that's been a, 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 a message in our companies for years, who not how. So with that, we always learn from books. And I agree with you. Go get that book. If you've not read it, read that one. So we've talked about three books, Becoming Your Own Banker by Nelson Nash, um, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, okay? And we've talked about who, not how. Is there any other that you would say, hey, everybody in the audience that you have that same, I love that passion, Brian. I love you when you said, hey, you almost said, stop listening to the podcast. I'm glad you didn't say that. We can edit that out. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But, uh, uh, and, and the, you know, go read this book immediately. Is there another book that comes to mind? You, you know, I, I, I begged my wife uh, to read Who Not How, and she was almost like the way the way I hear you talk about it and your who's and your how's and your this and that. She's like, you sound like Dr. Seuss. Uh, she was like, what, what is it? You know, what is this? You can't book? say that no. anymore, Brian. Dr. Seuss is bad now. No. That's right. That's right. That's right. Uh, but outside of that book, you know, one book that we run our company on is Traction by Gino Wickman. It's, uh, and you, if your listeners have heard of EOS, the Entrepreneurial Operating System, it is the foundation that our company is built on. And it really helps, you know, entrepreneurs and visionaries and integrators really hone in on that operating system and process. Because at CF Capital, we, we've built a business. We're not running around what I call, quote unquote, just doing deals. Like we have a business, we're structured, we have acquisition strategy and too many businesses out there just kind of find themselves chasing their tails. So if there's any entrepreneurs out there that are burning the midnight candle and working 80, 90, 100 hours a week and can't seem like they can get their hands on things, you know, traction is the book for them. Um, outside of that, our book, Jim, uh, my partner and I, we we wrote a book earlier this year. You can grab that off our company website. Our book is called The Bottom Line, 10 Ways to Increase Cash Flow in an Apartment Complex. And again, awesome. I did not yeah. even know that. So I'm glad yeah. I'm glad that you brought that up because I was not aware of the book. I, I've known Tyler, um, but I did not know that there was a book. So I'm glad, that, by the way, that the book's not like three years old. And I'm thinking, why didn't Tyler <laughs> even mention that? So, uh, no, uh, new, new release. And I've been a called a lot of things in my life, but, uh, author is a new title. I guess I can add to that list. I understand. I understand. I'm, I'm in the process of writing a few books and, uh, I'm, I, I don't know why I haven't br uh, brought any of them to the finish line yet, but, uh, but I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to step up and make that happen. Um, all right. Well, Brian, any famous last words before we wrap it up? No, Jim, I just want to thank you and your listeners again, uh, both for, for the time today. Um, it's been a blast catching up with you, but more importantly, working with you over the past few months. And for those listeners out there, don't, don't just stop the podcast and go along with your day. Listen to it, re-listen to it, pick up two or three things that Jim has said. And at the end of the day, just take action. Life is all about taking action. So after this is over, make sure that you get at least two or three takeaways. Don't let it just be 30, 40 minutes of your life that you never get back again. I love that. That's great advice. You know, that reminds me of uh, the book, The Magic of Thinking Big by Dr. David Schwartz. 
And he says, you know, most people are afraid. And he says, there's only one thing that cures fear. And he says, action cures fear. If you think about every time in your life, that's, you know, it's okay to be afraid, but you just have to take action to eliminate that fear. You just go through and check off the fears that you have on, in your life. And, and that's how you make progress. One of the definitions that Tony Robbins uses of, uh, of happiness is making progress regardless of what it is. So in this, in this uh, episode, you know, Brian has shared a lot of great, great information of how to break away. And Brian, thank you so much for being on the show. And audience, until next time, if you're not broke, if you haven't broken away, then you're part of the herd. In the herd, nothing good happens in the herd. Until next time, I'm your host, Jim Oliver. Thanks again, Brian. Thanks, guys.